So good morning. Glad to be back with you and glad to get started. <laughs> Thank you, I had to come home. Eventually you have to come home. <laughs> so I, I was, uh, I'll share with you a bit about where I was, then we'll share a blessing. Um, in the last two weeks, I was in Israel for a rabbinic convention, um, and it was also to lay some of the groundwork or to begin planning for the trip that we have planned, uh, Jonathan and I, for, for Calvary, the wider community, an interfaith trip to Israel in October, about more, more about which you'll, you'll be hearing, there'll be material and opportunities to learn about. Um, it, being in Israel is always a, an exciting opportunity and always seems very timely given the number of events going on at any given time that make international news. And if you're following what's happening in the um, Israeli political arena right now, there's a lot of um, uh, um, foment and a lot of concern about the direction that Israel has what has long been understood to be the only democracy in the, in the Middle East, what's happening within its balance of powers and within strong executive leadership and changing uh, the laws. There's no constitution in Israel, um, but there have been democratic principles and legal uh, modeling on, on Britain and on the United States with regard to checks and balances and different branches of government, and those are sort of getting conflated now where there's a threat to that. So there's a lot of civic um, concern and um, politiciz politicization and... Um, sort of red and blue struggles uh, that we know about here are, are happening, happening in Israel also. Um, and it's an exciting time in terms of relations with neighbors, and that's always the case, and it's exceptionally beautiful and significant and, and special to be there. So I hope that um, we'll have opportunity. I know we'll have opportunity. I hope you'll also consider availing yourself of the chance to travel with us uh, to Israel, to the Holy Land in October. There'll be more about that. I'm happy to talk with you. Let's uh, transition to the text in front of us, and we begin with a blessing for our study this morning. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech Olam, Asher Kitshanu Mitzvotav Tivanu, La Asok Bedivrei Torah. Blessed are you, source of life and inspiration in the universe, who has enjoined us to engage with texts of meaning. Amen. In this story, we are following up on two other stories that we're familiar with in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, what's the story anybody know normally called the one we're talking about today, Luke 18? You ever heard it? Normally the rich young ruler. Uh, that actually doesn't exist in the Bible. We often, we do this with Christmas all the time, this story or version of it appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, three different Gospels and we conflate or smash together versions of all three of those and come up with what we think is this. The, the Luke version we're reading today never mentions the guy's young, the other ones do, and this one says he's rich, and so we put that together. Uh, I added an extra piece because it's a transition um, and about the, Jesus bringing the young or the little children to him. People were bringing even infants to Jesus that he might touch them, and when the disciples saw it, they sternly ordered them not to do it. But Jesus called for them and said, Let the little children come to me and do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. A certain ruler asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. He replied, I've kept all these since my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, there is still one thing lacking, sell all that you own and distribute the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when he heard this, the ruler became sad for he was very rich. <laughs> Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? He replied, What is impossible for mortals is possible for God. Then Peter said, Look, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, Truly, or Amen, I tell you, 
there was no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not get back very much more at this age than the age to come eternal life. I always want to say the gospel of the Lord at the end of that, which is what we say in church. Uh, these stories I mentioned come in quick succession, and if you notice, this is not technically a parable in the way that we've been talking about it, but the story of, in a row, the persistent widow and the unjust judge, and the Pharisee and the tax collector, collector and the little children, and then this rich ruler are all in succession, and all of them share a theme they're about the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven in Matthew. And they illuminate different parts of that, different aspects, but all have a very similar way of, of doing it, of sharing that. So that's why I included that today. Plus, it's a really fun story. Uh, who, who can tell me what happened with the persistent widow and unjust judge? Recap that in 10 seconds. <laughs> 20 seconds. <laughs> Catherine? Persistent widow harassed the judge because she was aggrieved, could not get what she want. And if you remember my favorite part, she's wearing me out by punching me in the eye. She's going to give me a black eye. As I talked about, sometimes in that parable, we're the unjust judge. That's often traditionally how it's characterized. And then it also might be that we're the persistent widow, knocking, pounding on God to pay attention to us. And it's about the persistence of prayer. That is about the kingdom of God. And in that society, remember, where was a widow on the hierarchy? Way up here? Oh, no. Way down, like, way down there. Then there follows the story of a tax collector and a Pharisee. So a Pharisee on the hierarchy in that society is where? Higher. And the tax collector is where? <laughs> Lower middle class. <laughs> Got money, but no class. That's what we'd say. <laughs> Tax collectors were not viewed as good people because, generally speaking, I mean, the stereotype of them was they made extra money because they were, they were Jews who worked for Rome, so the enemy, and they took their taxes for Rome, and then they charged extra bribes, etc., for themselves. Horrible, horrible people. Any of the disciples a tax collector, by the way? Yeah. Matthew, probably. And so, Jesus was a tax collector, right? he, he took care of the money of the disciple. He was their treasurer. Um, great point, Allison, thank you. So with that, with the Pharisee and the tax collector, in that story, the Pharisee goes up, and our equivalent would be, goes up in the church and says, oh, thank you, God, I'm not like those people. You know, the vagrants, the homeless, and everybody who's just not good in society because I tithe, I fast, I go to church all the time. I am particularly holy and awesome and notably humble. Everybody knows how humble I am. And thank you. You're welcome, Jesus, is basically. Now, Pharisees wouldn't say that to Jesus, but you're welcome, God, for my greatness. And Jesus contrasts that to the tax collector who stands off to the side so nobody can see him and says, have mercy on me, a sinner. He's humble before God. And Jesus said, the tax collector is the one that God listens to. And so you get this, wait, the widow, the tax collector, they are not qualified for the kingdom. So these two things are just ringing in people's heads. And then you get the children stuff. And there's no transition that we can tell. It's just right there. So, uh, and all these things obviously are conventional wisdom turned on its head. The little children, what, how, when we talk about children, what do we think of? Innocence, Innocence purity, <laughs> little bundles of joy and potential <laughs> until you have to stay up all night. What? <laughs> Promise, hope for the future. What, where were they, where are they children? Are, are the future. Where, that was a joke. 
Where are children in the social hierarchy of American society? Pr pretty high. Maybe not top, but pretty high. So where were children in the hierarchy of Jesus culture? No. Pretty low. Not quite a slave, but way, way down there. They're not people yet. What was, uh, let's add, they cost money. Here's something we just don't think about. And, uh, and not to make you, well, actually, it's exactly, precisely what I want to do. To make you a little uncomfortable, in the context of the story, we in this room are incredibly rich compared to everybody there, including all the rulers and kings and so on. What was, what's our infant mortality rate in America today? I don't, I don't know that. Who knows? Approximately? Fifty babies out of a hundred in America die. Is that true? No. No. One? Less? Yeah, that's high, less. What was, so one percent or below. What was it in Israel at the, or that time in Palestine? Thirty percent. So think of, and I don't mean to make you too uncomfortable in that regard, 30% of infants died in childbirth or soon after. And if you made it to six, that was up to 40%, didn't make it up to age six. So you're talking about lots and lots of people dying. And if you're a parent who would do anything to give you know, their kid health and a chance and so on, and you heard stories about Jesus who healed the blind man and help somebody who was lame to walk. And what would you do with your kid if he had, you know, what would you die from, by the way? Sickness, famine, any type of disease, war, loads of stuff. So children were not high on the social scale, but beloved by their parents. And so wouldn't you want to take him to the, maybe this is your shot to have her or him be healthy. And uh, that's what happened. But then what did the disciples do? Sternly ordered them <laughs> not to do it. Uh, so you have to imagine, what works for me is a pop star with an entourage. Get out of the way. Go away. Kid. Don't bring those nothing kids up here. We're here for important people. They're bouncers. Now, Jesus didn't care for the, all the time the disciples were like, come on, guys. And they missed the point. He stern, the disciples sternly ordered them not to do it. But what did Jesus do? You'll notice the, the way he says this, let the children come to me. He doesn't say, let the children, let the parents bring the children to me. Let them come. Which is an even weirder thing. That he's comfortable with other people's kids, which wouldn't necessarily do, let them come because they become a witness, an example for this. Such to such as these belong the children, uh, belong the kingdom of God, and not because they're pure, innocent, potential bundles of hope for the future, because why? Well, yeah, maybe they're innocent, but because they're nothing. They have no qualifications for the kingdom. Like the widow, like the tax collector, they're not there. Charles? I think it's also interesting to remember that the disciples abandoned their own children and families. They did. Probably, probably they wouldn't have had children. They were quite young, the disciples. They would, they did, at least like... Uh, Peter, Andrew, James, and John most likely abandoned their father in the boat, a fisherman. Um, abandoning parents was a very, very bad thing uh, because you're supposed to take care of them. So probably they didn't have children. I don't, it's, it's not clear if they had a wife, any of them had a wife yet, but they did leave their family. And that, that does come up later. Um, so whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will not enter it. With humility, without social standing, with innocence, with all those things together. So you're, he's building a case over time, if you think about it, of who's 
qualified. And we haven't even got to what in the world is the kingdom or what's this other question that's about to be asked. Um, the, uh, I'll add one point here. Do, um, they were sternly ordered and do not stop them is the word in our translation or phrase in our translation. The traditional word is hinder. I really like the word hinder. It's not used enough in society today. In the Gospel of Luke, it's used here. In the book of Acts, it's used multiple times. And Acts is one way to think of it as a sequel to the Gospel of Luke. Multiple times the word hinder comes up to the Ethiopian eunuch, to the Samaritans, to the Gentiles, when those groups are hindered from hearing the Gospel. It's keeping them out. To hinder, you have to have power to stop, to hinder someone without power from having a thing or going somewhere. So that, that's operative here in all of that. With no translation, or sorry, no transition, we go straight to the rich ruler. So presumably the kids are still coming up, and then this rich ruler walks up to Jesus and says to him, <clears throat> Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now that question just goes right over our heads. When we say eternal life, what do we mean? Heaven not dying. I love you both, but no and no. When we say eternal life, what do we mean, at least in the church? God. So think of kingdom of God and eternal life as not synonymous, but complementary and very similar to one another. So the kingdom of God we've talked about over and over, which is the main message that Jesus teach, taught, proclaimed, um, God's will on earth as it is in heaven. God's reign come to earth. This is what it looks like when God's redemptive vision for the world is enacted, how people treat one another, how we live in the creation and so on. And eternal life is related to that when we live in the kingdom with the kingdom values, we inherit eternal life now, we're living in the kingdom now, and then it's extended forever, what you'd call forever and ever, amen. So eternal life is now and the future, but it's a both and type of thing, of the kingdom enacted in our lives and in the world. Does that make sense? I just made that up, but I think that's true. <laughs> Russ, do you check me on that? I think that's right. Close enough. <laughs> if I have Russ's approval, I'm doing well. <laughs> yes, uh, Mary? Oh, so whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter, enter it. Is that a precursor to infant baptism? Maybe indirectly. Why would you, in some traditions, Baptist, for example, you only baptize an adult who's made a personal decision, and usually, to accept Jesus as personal Savior, to, to be a Christian um, as a public declaration of faith, all of those things, and then baptism would be to show the world and to, to live into the life of the kingdom. In most Christian traditions, uh, Episcopal, Roman Catholic, Lutheran, a whole bunch of other Protestants, Orthodox, they also baptize infants who cannot make a decision like that. And why would we do that, infant baptism? Early recruiting. <laughs> That's a brilliant answer, <laughs> and I would say that's sociologically true. Maybe not theologically, but absolutely correct. Practically, they assume they would, they might die young, so want to get to them first. C kind of, Catherine. 
They're part of the kingdom of God. And I've wrestled with this particular question since I was 18. And it used to drive me crazy. And the simplest explanation that I finally partially accepted because I was tired of thinking about it is the Baptist version, the the more Protestant version, shows our initiative as human beings to accept God's grace. We call that the faith part. The divine initiative that God created the world, it fell apart through our actions, and then God creates a plan through the covenant people of Israel and then prophets and then with Jesus to restore all of creation is all God's initiative. And so the baptism with redeeming this child is God's initiative and then it's our recognition of that. Does that make sense? So you have one is more human initiative, the Baptist version, and one more divine initiative, the other. And I can, I finally more or less made peace with that. Russ? <coughs> Hold on, I, I do need to get you on the mic because that's important. My understanding is the Christian teaching on original sin originates almost entirely in one line in Paul's letter to the Romans, um, as elaborated later by Augustine and others. Uh, the idea is that we are all born into damnation and we somehow have to work our way out of that. What Jesus is saying of these little children here seems to be quite contradictory to that. They are already sharing in the kingdom. Yes, that's precisely true. So what is original sin? All of us are born uh, basically evil. Uh, That's original sin. You could disagree with it. But the idea is we're all born... Uh, removed from God. There is a barrier. There is a chasm. And once you start, it's one of those, you start down the road and then there are all these other things that have to happen the further you go, farther you go down the road. Well, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Like you'll hear that is a very common phrase used. And then there's this elaborate system built up to how to deal with that, and then you get uh, atonement or at-one-ment theories of Jesus on the cross and so on. Uh, And it comes from what Russ is saying in in Paul, but also from the story of Adam and Eve. And how is sin transmitted? This is where the part of the odd consequence of all that. It's mind-blowing. Through sexual intercourse through sperm and egg, it's tra- sin is transmitted like, what? But these are the theories that were developed trying to understand that. I think a much more plausible theory is that everybody has that innate tendency to be selfish, to be not God-focused, to not be focused on neighbor. Well, you just, in children, you see that. I see it every day in the preschool. They have to learn It's not okay to bite him. You can't knock her over because you want to ride the toy now. Oh, and you have to share. Those things you learn on the playground or um, later, hopefully. But that idea of original sin has stuck very, very deeply in our heads. It's absolutely, I don't want to say central, but vital to Roman Catholicism, to orthodoxy, less so in our tradition. We have tended to value that people are, it also comes down to, do you think people are innately good or innately bad? Is there, and so even if, well, I don't really think of either, but a lot of people do. And is there such a thing as evil in the world? If so, if you don't believe it's not from people, where does it come from? All those questions are there. That is not, I don't think, exactly what Jesus is talking about here, but it does open up all these uh, interesting questions. Russ? Well, I think it's time to invite a Jewish perspective. <laughs> <laughs>
I, that was the next move, is when we talk about eternal life, he's ready to go. So when we say eternal life, what does that mean within Judaism? We tend to think of it as uh, the way in which we're remembered. Um, there are concepts of heaven and hell and afterlife, what Hebrew uh, tradition calls olam haba, the world to come. But contemporary mainstream Jewish thought about life eternal and the rest is how we, how we behave here such that we're remembered beyond our own existence. But that's been a, that's been a, a significant yet subtle shift over the centuries, much like our thoughts about young, newborn babies being innocent is a, is, a, is a very different concept than original sin, which is why the, the reaction in this room was such that the idea that a baby is evil, a newborn baby comes in with those, right, sort of star-crossed, is, uh, is antithetical to us today. Um, the other is that Judaism puts little uh, time into describing the world to come. We've referred to the kingdom of heaven as um, the messianic age, but much more focused on how we behave and what our experience is here, and not using, per se, uh, the next realm, heaven, hell, purgatory, all those ideas, not relying on that as either a cudgel or a carrot and stick, but really being focused on how we behave here and now. There may be a reward, but the, the fact is we're concerned with what we do, how we behave here. It's, it's not meant to be a dodge, but that's essentially the truth. That's right. Would you repeat that, Eric? <clears throat> so the comment is made that we believe that everyone is born sort of a tabla rasa, that you have the ability to be evil or the ability to do, wet, to do good. In much the same way, I like just sharing this because I remember learning and having sort of my mind blown, that when a baby arrives in the world, that baby has the, the capacity with vocal cords and the rest to make any sound that human beings can make, any accent, any, right, and, and, any um, difficult letters in foreign languages or the kind of thing that we stumble over. But because who they hear from in utero and who's teaching them as, as they grow, we learn to speak in a certain dialect or with a certain cadence that is not only difficult to shake, but then there is difficulty acquiring other language skills later on. Um, but it's about, we come, we come with that capacity, goodness, evil, what have you, and it's, uh, you know, there's the Native American uh, teaching that there are two wolves inside of us, one that's good and one that's evil, and which one survives? Well, it's the one you feed, is sort of the idea. That we have um, evil inclinations and we have inclinations for good, and it's just a matter of which choice, not that it's ever so simple, but which one we, which side we err on. Um, can I uh, say something about um, some of the things that Jonathan, Jonathan has shared? The idea of hindering someone's access to the, to the kingdom or to knowledge, uh, we were discussing this just before. It's a question as to whether or not that hindrance is provided by someone who's serving as a gatekeeper, someone who's powerful or has the, 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 the ability to determine who goes left and who goes right. Right, that's sort of from uh, coming off the trains at the concentration camps. You were marked for death if you, they pointed one direction or, or the other direction you, you lived another day. Um, whether the hindrance comes from outside or whether we are hindering ourselves. Whether we know that, that we can be our own worst enemy. We know that we can convince ourselves of nearly anything. We know that uh, we turn a blind eye to our own faults or, or weaknesses or, or failures. Um, and, and spin them in a, in a very different way. So when I was reading this, what I was intrigued by is what is this idea, we're now in the parable, I'm moving away from the, from the children, but what is this idea that there's one additional thing that you haven't done? When, when the fellow comes to Jesus and says, what do I need to do in order to win eternal life or to earn eternal life? First, we should appreciate that this is a common trope in these, in, this, in these times, we have stories in the Talmud where a heretic or a proselyte or a philosopher, meaning it's someone from the Greek culture, approaches a rabbi. Classically, there were two, Shammai and Hillel, and it asks of them, it's distilled down in sort of a Jewish parable, a man comes and asks, what, do I, what is the entire Torah? Explain it to me while you stand on one foot. 
And so now the idiom, al regel achad, on one foot, is a Jewish way of sort of saying, in a nutshell, or give me the bottom line, or what's the skinny, or what's everything I need to know while standing on one foot, distill it down to me. Which is essentially what this fellow is asking of Jesus. Give me the whole story, but you got, I got 20 seconds. You know? You get 200 words. Go. That kind of thing. So that's a common idea, um, I was going to say first. Uh, but the idea that there's one thing lacking is fascinating. Because, in this case, this fellow is described as rich, and the, that which he lacks is an, is an inability to define himself absent his riches, which is why he's so distressed, right? He can't imagine who he would be absent that characteristic or that quality or that, that cash in his account, right? And then it goes on to describe, so for such a man, what the recipe is, what he needs to do. And then we focus on that and we all imagine ourselves as the rich man in this case. We began by suggesting how, how well off we all are, certainly in contradistinction to those who are completely powerless or without. But I wonder if that formulation, the answer, if we haven't um, sort of gotten stuck on that. And while the answer that's given is a particular answer Jesus gives to this rich individual, if we were to put ourselves in the, in the place of the individual who asks, what's required of me, and we get a list, we can imagine the first part of the answer, this list that comes from the Ten Commandments that are about interpersonal behavior, an answer we've seen essentially before in an earlier parable, right? Yeah. Um, where the answer is not, as you might imagine, well, you have to have, have complete faith, or you have to have this theological, or this creedal, or this, 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 this belief, but rather it's how you behave, which is itself really interesting to me, that that's the emphasis. Um, and then there's one thing lacking. So if we were to take the first part of the verse and say, okay, we need to behave in these ways, and there's one additional thing, something you didn't expect, something that's counterintuitive, why would we assume that the answer that's given to this rich individual is the answer that we would receive as well? I mean, that may be the, the, the stumbling block that you have. You have too much of a self-definition based on your, on your finances or the physical objects you own in your home in which you take pride. But likely, each one of us would have a slightly different answer, respective of one another, and certainly different from this particular archetype in the story, in that we each have that which, if it were only one item, we'd be so lucky. We each have that which is, for us, our own stumbling block, our own impediment, our own... Idol. Our own hindrance. Idol. Our own idol. That which frustrates our ability to move beyond who we understand ourselves today such that we would merit, whether it's the kingdom of God, whether it's heaven, whether it's whatever, whatever it is. What is the qualification? What is the quality? What is it that we need to, uh, to divest ourselves of? And before you leave this morning, I want to put in your hands a conversation that I made into a transcript that I shared with ChatGPT, the AI, um, about this parable. Can you tell uh, us this standing on one leg? I can. Okay, thanks. I can, but I'm going to give it to you. It essentially comes back to the idea that the name of the parable is itself a hindrance for us. Right? It already closes certain things off, or it already puts a thumb on the scale in terms of what we ought to focus on. And I proposed uh, in this conversation that, that ChatGPT give us other, other definitions or other names. So let me share with you what was proposed there, and then I'll let you take this when, when you go. One was called the challenge of wealth, the importance of surrender, the limits of human achievement, the promise of grace. But I called it the one thing you lack, so that the focus would be again on ourselves rather than the particular protagonist in the story. And we might focus on what is it that we aren't recognizing but is our, our impediment. Um, I'll come back, come back to that. Um, can I say a few things about the way this fellow is described? Yeah. Great. So if we go to um, the, the language that's used, at least in our translation that's provided to us, by way of the adjectives that are used to describe Jesus, um, and the adjectives that are used to describe his interlocutor, um, he addresses him as good, good teacher, right? And Jesus' retort is, why do you call me good? Only God is good, right? And I was struck by the fact that the word good first appears in the Torah in the descriptions of the creation of each day of, of the week. Each day is good, 
It concludes. There was a morning, there was evening, and there was morning, the first day, it was, it was good. Ex the only difference, deviance from that, is that when human beings are created, human beings are called very good. So that's just sort of interesting. When something is, is good, we might think that's actually very nice. It turns out that it, it, it's not as good as not as good as very good. Right? So there's just sort of an echo of, of that. Um, there's also a, a sense of false flattery. If we refer to someone um, as the good doctor or the good rabbi, it could be an honorific, but it's sort of damning one with, false, with faint praise. Right? If you're only good as opposed to the excellent doctor or the excellent uh, uh, rabbi, it's, just sort of, it's sort of an interesting uh, question. Could it be mockery? Could it be a, a sense of derision? Does one protest too much? If you say, well, I'm not good, only God, only God is good. The other um, thing that made me echo with that with regard to good in that case, or I'm not good, I think I've mentioned this before, that in the 12th century, Moses ben Maimon, Maimonides, a great Jewish uh, philosopher and scholar, introduced a concept that we know today as negative theology. Have we said anything about this before? Negative theology is essentially the recognition that because our language and our ability to make ourselves understood with language is necessarily limited, both because of the limits of language and our own ability, inability uh, to, make our, to, to express ourselves completely or to be completely understood, renders anything that you might say in the affirmative about God as necessarily short of what God deserves and therefore blasphemy. So if you say God is good, what do you know of goodness? If you say God is love, what do you know of love? Human love? You've experienced something really, really special? You think that captures God's love? Calling, saying that God is love is itself a failure to appreciate the fullness of God, and therefore we should shy away from it. And all we can say, says Maimonides, is what God is not. God is not good as I understand good, but of a different dimension. That idea. So when we call a teacher good, or when we... We might sort of wonder whether or not that is uh, as, as the what, what the speaker's intent is in point of fact, uh, was. Um, the other is th this idea about being rich. When someone is described as being, as being rich, the Talmud has a set of, um, I call them Jewish koans, like the, um, the, the, the Buddhist teachings, what's the sound of one hand clapping. Um, there are a number of them in a collection of the Talmudic wisdom teachings called Pirkei Avot, the, the ethical teachings of the sages in which is a series of questions, who is strong, who is wise, who is happy, right? Those kinds of questions. And the answers in each case are rather counterintuitive. And the, one who, uh, the answer to the one who is rich is the one who's satisfied with what they have, right? That is to say, we know people, um, maybe you're among them, who have more than you ever imagined, but in comparison to others, you feel yourself lacking, or you're aware of what you don't have, your house, your boat, your bank account isn't as large as someone else. And so in comparison, you don't feel yourself to be rich in contradistinction with the person who, irrespective of what they have or don't have physically or financially, considers themselves rich and that they're satisfied. Right? Now, this can play against itself if you're completely satisfied and complacent and happy to hang out on the couch all day playing video games and you said, oh, I'm satisfied. I don't really have any ambitions and I don't have any uh, work ethic and I'm just happy with myself is not how the the verse is intended to be, but rather a sense that you have your, the ability to meet your own needs and you possess the subjective sense that you have more than you require or that is coupled with a sense of, of gratitude is in Jewish tradition what the definition of being rich is, which is very nice if you don't have a lot of money. Um, I would also say that, 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 be, that, that the idea of being rich carries with it a sense that you're satisfied or that you, you have your needs met in that way. Maybe a sense it keep you up at night if you don't have enough, but you have your needs met, you're satisfied in that, in that, in that uh, uh, sense, you're happy, um, you're content, but it can also then blind us to certain things when we're too self-satisfied or we're too, we're too comfortable and we've lost a sense of what's going on in the world around us or what other people's experience is or we forget where we came from if we weren't always, um, if we weren't to the, man to the manner born. Um, and so I wonder if the notion of rich here, in order that we see ourselves in the story, because we may or may not consider ourselves rich in financial terms, if we said that the person who comes to Jesus is self-satisfied, or the person who comes to Jesus is proud in, the, in all the worst ways that, that, that pride manifests itself, 
And the challenge to divest himself of his money is the challenge to each of us to divest ourselves of our own self-satisfaction or our own hubris. And so what would you put in that if it were being directed to you? If Jesus were to say to you, in answer to your question, much like this uh, protagonist in the story, what do I need to do? You get a list of the behaviors you're supposed to engage in. And there's one more thing. And if you were to answer for yourself, what would be that one thing that you would need to give up or that you would need to change your self-understanding around such that you could move forward in your own spiritual or moral development? And that's what I'm going to send you home with. Uh, What did, so even within uh, Judaism, what did the Pharisees think about resurrection? They rejected it. And uh, some groups accepted an idea of the resurrection. Uh, the Greeks tended to have, and I, I mean, this is characterizations, obviously, some type of immortality of the soul. And what, what does the Bible actually teach about resurrection? Anybody know what happens when we die? Is that what it says? I'm sorry to disappoint. You do, Allison. Absolutely. Our theology, you hear, you read it in the prayer book, is a very strange mixture of a few things. One is this Greek immortality of the soul idea. And in, early on in Jesus' time, some people believed in some sense of a general resurrection. And what that meant is, well, maybe their body is reconstituted in some type of way. Or maybe there is a, a symbolic, metaphorical meaning to that, which is probably how a lot of people would think of it now. Well, my spirit is resurrected. I'm made new again in some way. And then what developed the actual idea in the Bible, and this is mind-blowing for a lot of people, when we die, that we, we fall asleep in a spiritual sense. And then after some time, there is a resurrection of the body. It's a physical thing, not just a spiritual thing. And it's all of the creation is remade, renewed, reformed, all of that together. It's like, wait, that's, in the, that's actually what it talks about? It's not a complete, fully laid out thing. Layered on top of that is this Greek idea of the immortality of the soul. And so when most people think, well, when I die, my body rests or disintegrates or is burned up or buried, whatever, but my soul goes to heaven. That's what most people think. I'm not disagreeing with that at all. That's actually not been the teaching of the faith for a long time. But most people, even in Christianity, that there's an immortality of the soul, and that's what we think. If you have to think, it's good to remember, I should say it this way, our Christian faith is a product of many things coming together, mainly Jewish inheritance, but then smack up against this Greek or Roman world where these ideas collide and merge into something else. And so it's all mixed together, and it's not a clean thing. So, and in Hebrew scriptures, in the Jewish Bible, the Torah and the Hebrew prophets, there's not a concept of eternal life. The, the, the euphemism is that when you die, you're gathered to your kin. You sleep with your ancestors. Bring my bones back from Egypt. Joseph, um, uh, uh, Jacob, as Joseph promised to, to do, right? But um, there's not a notion until later, the interaction with, with Greek culture, where these other ideas enter, which is why these, in the Jewish parables, as they were, we have a, a Greek philosopher approach the rabbi and challenge him. Because the Judaism in, in those centuries was grappling with these, with these different ideas and what's happening with the nascent Christian community and the rest. We're in, yeah. we're in dialogue. But the Torah knows nothing about there, The life. very first reference of anything like that is in the book of Daniel. That's why I wanted to look up. 
And Daniel's written uh, about 165 before Common Era, so roughly 200 years before Jesus. And remember, these Gospels are written 40 years later. Uh, Daniel 12, chapter 12, verse 2 says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So there is the nascent idea in the book of Daniel, which is towards the end of the, the Hebrew Bible. And then a couple hundred years after that, you get these ideas within the emerging Christian faith. So it's not like, here it is, it's, it evolves over time. Right. Susie? That's what all this is talking about. No one's so proved what's not that. provable. We hope. hope is the, uh, the right word. Uh, and faith I'll works. say... Sw- faith is a good word, too. <laughs> faith is a good word. The word that the, what we'll leave you with, when we say the creed, or we believe in one God, the, the better translation for how we think of things is not belief as in intellectual proposition, but it better translated as we trust that, we rely on, we base our lives on. So we believe in one God is much better than how, who can prove heaven? Well, of course, the answer is nobody except God, I guess. But we base our lives on. There are many things we don't know with 100% factual certainty, but yet you base your life on that. That's faith, that's trust, that's belief, at least in the Christian tradition. Anything else? Good rabbi? Yeah. Excellent, excellent, <laughs> excellent rabbi, sorry. I, I remember giving um, a sermon a number of years ago on Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, and it was at the, um, the same season that, um, I think it was in Dover, Pennsylvania, there was a big uh, case about creationism and intellectual design and right, intelligent design, and whether that should be taught in, cl- in, in science classrooms in the Commonwealth, right, and here we were reading the story of creation on, on Rosh Hashanah morning, and my sermon was about the fact we read this not because we believe it to be true, but because we want very much to believe in the fact that the w- world has an order, or that things make sense, which is what human beings do all the time. Right? We're trying to make meaning of our experiences. We, we create classifications and we have logical systems because at some level we have to suspend disbelief. How we got here or where we're going after this experience, it boggles the mind. Right? So we read things or we choose to believe things that give our lives meaning, which is separate than being able to prove them to be true. Does that make sense? Factually true. Factually true. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you all very much.